Um, welcome back, everybody. It's an extreme pleasure and honor to have Ray Goldstein here with us today to speak in the Living History series. Without any further ado, over to you, Ray. Please tell us about Living Many Histories. Well, thank you so much for the opportunity to be here. I, I've listened to quite a number of these presentations recently, and I have to say it's a, it's a wonderful uh, opportunity for the community to learn from each other about people's varied pasts. So I'm a professor in the Department of Applied Mathematics and Theoretical Physics at the University of Cambridge in the UK. I've been here for the past 16 years. And uh, just like many other people, I'll, I'll start with a little bit of background about myself and how I got interested in science. Um, I think the place to begin is, is with this nice picture on the left, uh, which was taken from my uh, undergraduate uh, graduation from MIT. I'm surrounded by uh, my immediate family, my two grandparents uh, in the front row there. I grew up in West Orange, New Jersey, which is not famous for too many things, except it was the home of Thomas Edison, the inventor. And we actually, through my father, knew uh, the Edison family a bit, which was quite a thrill. But the thing to say about my family is, is that there was a theme uh, there that, that isn't about science. So my father was an architect. My very tall oldest brother uh, in the middle there uh, is an architect. Uh, my middle brother uh, is an architect. And my mother professionally was an interior designer for much of her life. And so um, and they all also went to MIT. My mother went to Simmons nearby. And so you might think, what happened to me? <laughs> why, why did I not end up being an architect? And I think it was that somewhere along the line earlier, I had had some very strong influences that pointed out the uh, interest in science that might be there. And one of them, the main one, was Carrie Jacobus, shown in the picture on the top with her husband now in retirement in, in Florida. So she was my high school chemistry teacher. And uh, when she started out teaching, she was, I think, just fresh out of a PhD in organic chemistry. And um, I, I have been in touch with her every year since then for 43 years. And uh, she really opened my eyes to uh, the wonders of science and the wonders of chemistry in particular. And when I then went off to college at MIT, I was sort of torn between whether I wanted to be a physicist or a chemist. And after the first year where I had taken a lot of physics courses and a few chemistry courses, I kind of felt that physics wasn't right for me. It just seemed too hard and that I should really stick with chemistry. So for the next year or so, I, I focused completely on, on chemistry. Um, but by the end of my second year, when I had taken nearly all the really hardcore chemistry courses, I was nagged by a feeling that there was something sort of superficial about the chemistry education. It wasn't about fundamental aspects of science. It was sort of secondary. And I really yearned for something fundamental. So I talked to my father about this and he said, well, why don't you just do both? And so I, I then became a double major in physics and chemistry and uh, have always sort of lived in between ever since. But another very important influence for me was a final year course that I took with uh, C.C. Lin shown in the lower right, a very famous applied mathematician. It was in it was sort of an introduction to applied mathematics, uh, something I really didn't know much about. And it, it really was transformative for me because it, it was a way of doing mathematics that was very different from what I had seen in the physics curriculum. It was, it was more elegant, it was more powerful, it was more intuitive. And, and that sort of set me on a path eventually to mix things up uh, as well with applied mathematics. But in my final year and a half at MIT, I did some uh, research in statistical physics with uh, Nihat Berker, who was then a professor there. He's now back in his native Turkey, and here he is at the bottom. And uh, it was he who showed me the, the beauty of statistical physics and, and really motivated me to go to graduate school in that area. So I went to Cornell and I did my PhD with Neil Ashcroft. And he's not quite a, he wasn't then quite a statistical physicist, but he, he was willing to kind of helped me along. And, and so I worked sort of in parallel with him, not really closely with him uh, too much, but he was always there advising me in the direction to go. But another important uh, influence to me, not someone who was officially my advisor, but just someone basically whose extensive office space I was allowed to <laughs> sit in for quite some time was Ben Whittem at Cornell. And Ben influenced me most importantly in his incredible clarity of thinking, his clarity of speaking, and his clarity of writing. And in fact, I, I always will remember that uh, some years later, I went back to Cornell to give a physics colloquium. And the highest compliment I have ever received was when one of the physics professors came up to me afterwards and said of my talk, that was Widdham-esque. And I thought, yes, <laughs> I understood how to do it. Uh, so then 
at, at near the end of my graduate years, I, I really liked statistical physics, but I, I really wanted to work on something where things moved instead of just staying put. And there was no better place to go than the University of Chicago. And I was very fortunate to get a postdoc there, a rather free and flexible postdoc position where I was primarily mentored by Leo Kadanoff. And I gather that this picture, uh, this wonderful picture of him uh, has been seen many times in this series. And what Leo did for me was to give me the courage basically to study something just because it's interesting and not because the community thinks it's important. And he was uh, just a fabulous mentor uh, in, in many ways. The fourth person I've put here is not someone I ever worked with. This is Mitchell Feigenbaum uh, from Rockefeller University. He was very briefly at Cornell when I was a graduate student. I actually took electrodynamics from him and that was quite an experience, let me tell you. And the influence he had on me was, was very strange. Every few years, or maybe a little bit more frequently, I'd cross paths with him at a conference and have just an amazing hour or hour and a half discussion with him. And he would fill my ear with just fascinating stories about the old scientific literature and how he had come to understand the roots of various ideas. And that has stayed with me ever since, this, this idea that one should be well-read and really understand the scholarship of a field. So then um, I got an assistant professorship at Princeton. Uh, and by that point, when I was working on these areas of nonlinear dynamics and pattern formation, I, I was a little bit tired of trying to convince people to do experiments to test my ideas. And I thought, since I had a big grant from the NSF, one of these Young Investigator Awards, why don't I just kind of go back to my first base, which was a chemist being doing experiments and, and actually have a small experimental effort. And here I owe an enormous debt to Shamsundra Aramili, who was like me, a young assistant professor. And we just had a ball doing various projects. The first one we studied was a, a beautiful pattern formation problem involving magnetic fluids. And we just, he just helped me understand how to do experiments, how to analyze data. And, and together we, we wrote this, uh, this nice paper, which we were so naive, we, we just thought, oh, we'll send it to science as if that's the normal thing to do. And of course, you know, they'll just publish it. And amazingly, they did. But that was, that was just a fluke, I think. But in any event, I was getting more and more convinced that combining experiment and theory was the thing to do. And so a few years later, I moved uh, to the University of Arizona, primarily because of the opportunity to get in on the ground floor of a restructuring of a department that was very closely linked with applied mathematics, where we could have a, a really interesting mix of subjects. And for the next six or eight years, I basically continued retraining myself as an experimentalist, mostly with the help of John Kessler, shown here on the left. He's now over 90, but still going strong. And with John, um, I, I learned the wonders of many aspects of bacterial uh, fluid dynamics and biology. And we studied a number of problems. But the first one that we worked on was one where I was able to bring to the table my sort of theoretical background and understanding, uh, newly gained understanding of various experimental techniques like particle image velocimetry and other such things to, uh, to discover that there was this amazing uh, self-organized concentration, the self-organized behavior of concentrated bacterial suspensions that we now call bacterial turbulence. And uh, it also led to another very important uh, change in my research direction, which was that a graduate student in ecology and evolutionary biology, Christian Solari, came across the street. He was known to John, but not to me. And he told us about some fascinating behavior of green algae and interesting issues in evolutionary biology involving the transition from unicellular to multicellular organisms. And this, this really started us on the path uh, toward this uh, holistic link between theory and experiment in biology. And then finally, in 2006, I moved here uh, to Cambridge Applied Mathematics, where I really had an opportunity on a much grander scale to combine theory, experiment, physics, biology, and mathematics, and mostly on problems of evolution and developmental uh, biology, with a lot of fluid mechanics and statistical physics. I never took a course in fluid mechanics. I've, I've just managed to sort of pick it up on the street. And I just want to close with a couple of anecdotes about things that I think are important. One of them is always be open to whatever comes over the transom. So yes, I had my main research efforts in, in biological physics in those areas, but every once in a while something intervened. So for instance, when I was at Arizona, David Stone, an utterly brilliant uh, graduate student in a completely different department, emailed me out of the blue with a discovery he had made of some strange electrochemical deposition patterns uh, that he found uh, experimentally in his garage, basically. And could I help? And I thought it was fascinating. And so I gave him a space in my lab and Together, we, we worked out what was going on, but it led 
just due to an offhand comment of an undergraduate in my lab to realizing that there was a nearby problem involving the structural structures that form in caves, limestone caves, like stalactites and stalagmites, and that this was actually an unsolved problem in science to try to understand their shape. And that led to a, a, a whole new effort to, to solve that problem. And then while I was at Cambridge, I got an email out of the blue from Unilever, uh, mainly via Patrick Warren, you see on the left in the bottom picture. Would I be interested in studying the statistical physics of hair? And I thought it was the Nigerian email scam, but actually it was, it was real science. And, and it led to a, a pretty well-known work that we did on, on the properties of ponytails. And, and the point was not that I was an expert on ponytails. The point was that I sort of just had an open mind. And that open mind came from people like Leo Kadmoff and others who, who said, if it's interesting, just study it. So I guess I'll close by kind of trying to summarize the important lessons that I, that I learned. The first is just talk to lots of people in many different fields. Just ask them, what's interesting? What are, what are the unsolved problems? I wrote, read, read, read. It's important to just constantly be delving into the literature, old and new, to find out what's out there, uh, and also to ferret out the origins of ideas that help you understand what people's motivations were. But when it comes to finding a problem to work on, to me, it's a simple one. Just find a mystery. Just find a mystery, and, and if you can state it as a mystery, it, it's probably worth working on. And when I try to formulate talks and when I try to formulate papers, I always find it good to try to tell a story. This is something I learned from Phil Nelson, uh, many years ago, that it's, you just want to have a story to tell. It just makes it much more interesting and it helps guide the science. And the last thing I would say, especially to those who are younger in the audience is stand up for principles. And by principles, I mean not only the obvious things like giving credit where credit is due and being supportive to graduate students and collaborators, but also stand up for principles like maybe we shouldn't be publishing in journals that are run by profit-making corporations and we should vote with our feet and publish in society journals or open access journals like eLife that are trying to change the culture of science. And the only way these things are gonna change is if people like us actually take a risk and say, it's important, we've got to do it. And the final thing I'll say is, when I was a first year undergraduate at MIT, I um, was on a little committee of some social organization and we were asking scientists in MIT to come and speak to us. And I was assigned the task of calling up on the phone one David Baltimore, Nobel Prize winner at MIT, and asking if he, if he would speak in our little one hour get together. And I was terrified, but I managed to get through to him and I talked to him and explained what I wanted. And he politely said he wasn't available, but then he started asking me what I was interested in. And after I told him that I wasn't exactly sure what I wanted to do, et cetera, he said, let me give you some advice. You should do what you want and let the world find a niche for you. And I think that's a good piece of advice. Thank you. Wow, thank you so much, Shri. On behalf of the audience, I'm clapping. Um, I have several questions, but I'll be gracious and let other people go first. Anybody with a question, do you want to unmute and go for it? Now's your moment. Okay, so then I'm going uh, to- Maybe I could ask a quick one, Professor. I really appreciate your- I really appreciate your talk, particularly about reading. I am amazed at the researchers I've known over the years that uh, were studying, study, and then all of a sudden they discovered something 25, 50 years ago that provided a key aspect that pushed their research forward. Uh, I have a concern about the use of statistics in, in medicine in particular. Um, I have a physics background, but I practice as a physician. And uh, it seems that we are treating everything as static numbers, real numbers almost, and then finding ratios of rates and comparing different uh, time-limited experiments. And uh, I just don't see anybody really working on the aspects of comparing rates using uh, the feedback for Bayesian statistics, but also there, these are time dependent quantities and we treat them as time independent and that creates what I would consider aliasing issues over short. So do you know anybody working on those type of things? Well, uh, I'm not an expert anyway on that field, but I do have colleagues in this sort of crazy department that I'm in that has everybody from uh, string theorists to people who work on numerical analysis. Um, and uh, some of my colleagues like David Spiegelhalter 
uh, and uh, Julia Gog, who work on uh, the mathematics of epidemiology and risk, especially as applied to uh, health issues, are at the cutting edge of different ways of dealing with statistics. And, and so I might point you there, at least as a point of contact, where you, you might be able to find out the latest on those areas. Thank you, Tim. And um, Ray, I'll jump in with my question unless somebody else wants to go first. Sure. Okay, so, so, um, so, so, so on the slide where you had different influences from key people in your academic trajectory, you talk, you talk, talk so wonderfully about both, you know, be a pioneer and transcend boundaries and follow your heart and do what's interesting to you and don't be dazzled by what other people think is important. And on the other hand, you also had, um, you know, understand roots, trace the origin of ideas, look at the living histories of ideas. And I wonder if this balance between being the pioneer and this orthodoxy of tracing ideas um, also somehow feeds into surviving the, these very lean periods between <laughs> creative output. So in the feast and famine dynamic of uh, having an idea and doing dependence, somehow do, do these two different things feed in? Look, I think, I think you point out that this has to be a balance. It is, it, it's a balancing act. In fact, Phil Nelson, I'll, I'll quote here, he often said to me that life as a physicist is, is the balance between being a cowboy and a scholar. Um, and, and I think that summarizes perfectly. I, I, I tell that to my students all the time. Um, you know, you have to, it's sort of like you have to eat your broccoli, but you know, you, you can go <laughs> and enjoy yourself with the ice cream once in a while. So you have to, you have to have the discipline to say that once you've you know, decided on something, go back and, and see what's there. But there is merit to saying, I don't care what's there in the beginning. I'm just gonna go figure it out myself or at least try to figure it out myself. But just remember, once you think you've gotten somewhere, just check. I'll tell a funny anecdote if I have just a minute. Um, I wrote an article in Physics Today a couple of years ago about the um, benefits of reading the old literature. And, and one, of the, one of the things I said was that a plant scientist friend of mine had told me about some very interesting phenomena involving leaf stomata. And uh, I didn't know much about them. I read all about them. I discovered a really interesting uh, issue there, which I thought was um, unsolved, and, and I knew the way to solve it was basically to appeal to some work of Howard Berg and Ed Purcell in their famous paper on chemoreception. And I was like all ready to write what I thought was going to be this killer paper, you know, revolutionizing in the field of plant science. But then I thought, well, let me just really check carefully. And so I went back through the literature, I went back papers, 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 several weeks of this, and finally I discovered that in 1918, the entire problem had been solved. Um, and that I had nothing to say, but moreover, it was solved with the exact same technique that Berg and Purcell used in 1977, many years later, right? So, so you just have to be careful, right? But, but for a while, you've got to free yourself from the previous prejudices and just, just see what happens. So that it, that's the balance you have to do. Do due diligence eventually. Fantastic, thank you so much. On that note, I'm closing the recording.